Stanford University. Um, I'm Tom Byers, and I'm one of the uh, co-hosts this quarter, along with Tina Selig and Tom Kosnick. But this is my first day to be with you officially, and it is really something special. Uh, we have the, the chancellor of UCSF, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. But there's no other announcements. I hope uh, you're enjoying the quarter. Uh, I'll be back to do some other hosting. We're about halfway through already, believe it or not. Uh, and all the course information, of course, is up on etl.stanford.edu. So welcome to the Draper Fisher Jervison Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar Series brought to you by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the Business Association of Entrepreneur Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Um, it is uh, produced uh, by our good friends at SCPD and generously underwritten by Draper Fisher Jervison. Um, I as have the pleasure of introducing Susan. She is the chancellor of UCSF, and that's essentially the same as our own President John Hennessy here at Stanford. Um, UCSF is special to me. I'm a Berkeley graduate. Uh, that's one of the other campuses, but UCSF is uh, one of the ten, campus, uh, ten campuses of the University of California, um, but it's, it's a medical school. Uh, it, it, doing incredible research in that area, uh, teaching uh, graduate students in that area, and like our own uh, hospital here, uh, providing patient care. Uh, Sue was at this company I'm sure you've heard about, uh, Genentech, for many, many years. I mean, she started her career uh, years before that, but she was at Genentech for many, many years, at, including um, uh, the president of product development. We tried to have her here in the series during that period, so we kept at it. Uh, and we were successful today. Uh, the, I don't know if you got to see the bio, but this is pretty remarkable. Um, it was a little over a year ago, Forbes magazine named um, Chancellor Desmond Hellman as one of the world's seven most powerful innovators, uh, calling her a hero to legions of cancer patients. How many of you have had a family member who was touched by that? Uh, my mother, yeah, and I'm sure uh, others share that. So this, this makes it an incredible day. Um, the, all seven of them were lauded for their curiosity, empathy, and leadership. Those are all parts of why we do this seminar series. So when it, it came up that uh, we had a chance to have Suge come and join us, it was an absolute uh, no-brainer. So uh, let's give Susan Desmond Hellman a big Stanford welcome. kind uh, introduction and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. It's a beautiful day. The campus looks great. We, we have at UCSF what's called an urban campus. Uh, <laughs> many fewer palm trees than you have here. Um, so I, I have an agenda. I don't have slides because I thought that maybe I would just tell a few stories. I like to tell stories. And I wanted to introduce you uh, to being an entrepreneur and a leader in life sciences um, by introducing you a little bit to my journey and talking about some of the differences in how you can innovate or attack problems in life sciences from many different angles. Um, so as you just heard, I made a very unusual move uh, from Genentech back to uh, University of California, San Francisco. But before that, after I was a student, like you all are now, I had a very unusual and atypical journey. And I want to start by telling you a little bit about that, because I think it frames how I think about leadership and how I think about innovation. Um, after I went to medical school, I came to UCSF to be a resident, um, which means you do your, your clinical training in internal medicine. So that's the path where you're a general medical doctor. I, after four years of doing that and learning medicine on the wards in San Francisco, I decided to do an oncology fellowship. So I wanted to specialize in cancer. I wanted to be an adult cancer physician. And while I was in my first year, I got very, very interested in why people get cancer and decided that I wanted to be a cancer epidemiologist to study the natural history of cancer to specifically impact on patients not getting cancer. 
I think I was ahead of my time because everyone now thinks about health, wellness, and disease prevention. But we didn't have a lot of tools then other than stop smoking, which is the best way to avoid cancer and remains the best way to avoid cancer. But because of that interest I had, when I was a second year oncology fellow, when many of my colleagues went into the lab and started working on basic research, I did something very different. I went across the bay to UC Berkeley and got a master's degree in public health with a specific focus in epidemiology and biostatistics because I wanted to learn more about methodology. To become a cancer epidemiologist, I wanted to learn about things like p-values and inference and proving things like one does when you're trying to prove, for example, that something causes cancer or does not cause cancer. And that was a life-changing experience for me. It gave me a fantastic fundamental background for the way I think today and the way that I used that inference proof, those concepts later in my career. Now, as all of you know, you can have a very um, good notion of what you'll do in your career, and then life intervenes. So what made a big intervention on my path as a clinician when I was at UCSF was the HIV AIDS epidemic. And over the years, as I studied medicine and cancer, I became an expert in the kind of cancer that was most prevalent associated with the AIDS epidemic, Kaposi sarcoma and got into the study of Kaposi sarcoma. Again, the etiology, why did patients who had HIV infection develop Kaposi sarcoma? And as I was asking questions about that, two things happened. One, the Rockefeller Foundation approached UCSF and asked UCSF to start to study AIDS in Africa. And secondly, I decided, as I was investigating Kaposi sarcoma, to try and understand African Kaposi sarcoma, which had existed for a long time before the AIDS epidemic. So before it was popular for students to go into international health or global health, uh, my husband, who's an infectious disease doctor, and I were loaned by UCSF to Makere University in Kampala, Uganda. And I became the uh, attending physician at the Uganda Cancer Institute studying epidemic or HIV-associated Kaposi sarcoma and endemic Kaposi sarcoma, the kind of Kaposi sarcoma that had long been seen in Africa, a fantastic experience in global health. Following that experience, I went into private practice. I was what my parents now call a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> they might seem slightly disappointed when they say that. I put out my shingle, and every day, all day long, I saw patients with cancer. That was an experience that was one of the most amazing things that I had experienced in my career for two reasons. One is being a real doctor every single day led me to understand cancer at a very different level than I had before as someone who approached it from much more of a research standpoint. I learned much more about caring, healing, side effects, and compassion as they were associated with patients with cancer. And the other thing I learned is Cancer is a lousy business. And when I was in practice, we had too few remedies for what I cared about most, which was healing patients, making them all better, helping. And so after a couple of years in practice, I made another career change and went to Bristol Myers Squibb, which was the first experience I had in cancer product development. So Bristol Myers Squibb is and was then a very traditional pharma company, what's called big pharma, a very traditional, typically a chemistry type of company that uses chemistry to make small molecules and had a long tradition of cancer therapy. And at the time I went there, Bristol Myers Squibb had new drug called Taxol, Paclitaxel, which was a new cancer drug that was specifically being designed for breast cancer at the time. So I worked on Taxol for breast cancer for two years. Very traditional, very traditional, and it went very well. We were able to have Taxol approved for the treatment of breast cancer in the US and Europe, where it remains a mainstay of breast cancer therapy after many years have passed. So I tell you this background because I think one of the things that impacted me as an entrepreneur and as a leader was that journey so I was so privileged to be able to learn epi and biostat, some of the fundamental principles of how one thinks about product development, how to be a doctor, how to care for patients and think about what's good for patients, 
and very traditional pharmaceutical approach to product development. So today, I am at University of California, San Francisco, as you just heard, one of the 10 UC campuses after a 14-year career at Genentech in biotechnology. And what I thought I might do to help you understand and frame a little bit of how I think about entrepreneurship and innovation in the private sector or biotech and at UCSF in the academic sector is just tell you two stories. So I remain passionate about product development and innovation as it relates to helping patients. And I've had the privilege of doing so in very different settings. So the, I want to tell you two stories that I think help you understand a little bit more about how one thinks about innovation in biotech and innovation in academia. Um, uh, let me tell the story first about developing Herceptin at Genentech. So I left Bristol-Myers Squibb in 1995 and came to Genentech, uh, which was the first biotech company and founded in 1976 based on recombinant DNA technology, which was co-discovered at UCSF and Stanford. So that discovery of recombinant DNA technology started an industry. And I was thrilled when I got to Genentech to find out that it could be possible to treat cancer patients, potentially without the side effects of nausea, vomiting, hair loss, and bone marrow suppression, trying to use biology to treat cancer instead of chemistry to treat cancer, like Taxol. So the development of Herceptin was a, an extremely innovative project. And let me tell you three ways in which Herceptin was fundamentally different than anything I had ever been able to bring to cancer patients. First and foremost, Herceptin was the first time ever that a monoclonal antibody, a human-like monoclonal antibody, like we all make in our immune system, could be brought in large amounts to patients with a solid tumor, a very, very scary disease, fast growing, and likely to kill the patient. Now, at the time, monoclonal antibodies being natural, being human-like, were thought to be gentler treatments. And in fact, people used the slogan, could you have a kinder, gentler treatment for cancer? And I was a little puzzled by that. Having seen so many cancer patients, I didn't want to be kind and gentle when it came to the therapy of cancer. I wanted to wallop that cancer without causing side effects. But this monoclonal antibody therapy for the most difficult to treat breast cancer was completely innovative. And we were all relatively pessimistic about it. So one of the things I learned from that experience is don't be afraid to take risk and try something, even if everyone's skeptical, and everyone was. The second thing that was innovative about Herceptin, and now it seems routine, but at the time it was incredibly innovative, could you treat only the breast cancers that were driven by an oncogene a growth factor for that cancer called HER2. So only one in five of the patients with breast cancer had that driver. Therefore, we would only treat that one patient out of five whose cancer was dependent on HER2 to drive its growth. Personalized medicine, targeted therapy, now popular, while not routine, definitely the best way to treat patients, but incredibly novel. What that meant for the regulatory path is we had to go to FDA and ask for approval for the therapeutic and the diagnostic at the same time. Extremely hard and very novel. And the third thing that was so special about this is that the engineers in manufacturing had to be ready with the biotech process for making this antibody reliably using Chinese hamster ovary cells at the same time we were ready with the therapeutic. So you had to work in teams effectively with a large team that could go to FDA. So the experience of working in biotechnology to make the first antibody that had been approved for use in breast cancer was an amazing experience for me. And in the end taught me not just all those technical things, which we were able to overcome and obtain approval in 1998, but much more importantly, not to underestimate what was possible. I always thought that you had to be in discovery that you had to have that sort of test tube in one hand and light bulb going off over your head in the other hand to do something innovative. And as a clinician, I didn't see myself as an innovator. But that opportunity to take what had been made in the labs and bring it into clinical trials, use all those things I had learned about inference and proof 
and showing that Herceptin was good for patients with herdu driven breast cancer, I could be an innovator. A big breakthrough for me personally and something that my group, who were the D of R&D at Genentech, could take great pride in. So a very focused, product-driven innovation to bring something through the Food and Drug Administration to patients and other regulatory agencies to bring this product to market worldwide. Now, real forward 14 years, that was one of the great innovation experiences I had at Genentech. So in the summer of 2009, I left Genentech and returned to UCSF as chancellor. And students often ask me, what does the chancellor do anyway? Which I find uh, both endearing and a little daunting. Uh, and so what the chancellor does is the chancellor makes sure that the university, the citizens of UCSF, have the resources and talent they need to execute our mission. So I like uh, the description of UCSF that we're one of 10 campuses and we're the life science campus. I describe UCSF sometimes by what we don't have. No football team or basketball, no English majors, and no undergrads. UCSF is only a life sciences graduate school with a school of medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and a graduate division. Tiny students. 3,000 professional students, about 4,500 trainees total at UCSF, very specialized. So as chancellor, what do I do, for example, for patients with breast cancer, now that I've left my job in product development? Well, I wanted to tell you a, a story about innovation in breast cancer that's going on at UCSF to just describe what I think is possible in academia that's tremendously exciting to me. And as chancellor, I want to create the kind of environment that allows for that kind of innovation. So there's a trial that's going on at UCSF called the iSpy2 trial. The name's not as important as what the trial's trying to do. So today, if you tried to make a new Herceptin, on average, it would take you 12 years and a billion dollars. I don't like that. Those numbers are lousy. So that if, if five people in this room got ideas about new breast cancer drugs, we need to raise the capital for those five ideas and take that kind of time. And at some level, I think I want things to improve in our lifetimes for our, our generation as baby boomers, the generation after us, our parents. So what can I do? What can we do in academia to enhance our ability to innovate more quickly to improve cycle time? Well, what iSpy2 does is it's a trial of multiple therapies rapidly tested in sequence. And those therapies are tested at a particular moment in time before a woman with breast cancer has her primary surgery. So the really brilliant thing about this trial is that you can use a pick the winner strategy. You can cycle through multiple therapies and you pick the winner on two bases. One is when you do the surgery, is any of the breast cancer left? So you get a rapid readout. You could actually check the surgical specimen and see if any of the breast cancers left. And secondly, <coughs> toxicity. So you can throw out a product if it's ineffective or unsafe. And the trial combines imaging and biomarkers so that we can iterate and learn one product after another. We can also put combinations of therapies into this fast readout method of testing breast cancer drugs. So that wouldn't be possible at one company unless you had a huge stable of breast cancer drugs, which is not today the, the case at any company. We're working with more than five companies to bring many products into this system and iterate and test them rapidly. And having that kind of environment where our contracts and grants office, our intellectual property, can allow for us to collaborate effectively and innovate on the technical aspects of breast cancer studies so that as new discoveries are made, we can make things go faster and more efficient because asking and answering questions efficiently in life sciences is something we don't do yet and I think we need to do. So the ICE by 2 trial for me is a wonderful way in academia for us to have a system in collaboration with innovators in the private industry or in government that can allow for things to go through product development quickly. So a couple of lessons that I've learned in leadership and in innovation, both at Genentech 
and at UCSF I wanted to share with you in this class. Um, first of all, one of the things that I think is most challenging about anything that needs to be orderly, and I know many of you are engineers, some of you are in, in health sciences or life sciences, it, there's something very important about being a life sciences innovator, and that is that we don't have an experimental system, we have a human being. So the human beings who are involved in the trials, their protection, their well-being has to come first and foremost before anything. So think of yourself as wanting to hire, recruit, retain, reward innovators, risk takers in a world that involves human beings. So what I've learned more than anything is to be really clear of when it's time to take risk, when it's time to say, gee whiz, I wonder if we could try that, and when it's time to be very orderly. An example, when you're doing something that requires sterility. Sterility is an essential part of taking care of patients. When you put something in someone's vein systemically, it has to be sterile or they get a bacteremia, very bad outcomes. There's not a lot of wiggle room on sterility, right? There are things involved in manufacturing, things involved in running a hospital, which we do at UCSF, that involve compliant behavior, regulatory behavior, doing things the same way all the time, the Six Sigma kind of operating style. One of the great challenges and very important challenges is having room at UCSF for people who show up at noon and work all night, when right down the hall is somebody who shows up and punches a time clock and works on sterility. And a great leader has to have an operating style that works for both those people and is really clear about what behaviors we want, reward, and risk taking when risk taking can pay off and not have bad side effects. I think that's extremely important. The other thing that, that I took from private industry and brought to UCSF is, is the whole question of how do you incent the kind of behavior you want? So principal investigators tend to be rewarded for solo behavior. Are you first author or last author on a paper? Are you gonna win a prize, the Nobel Prize? Are you gonna publish? Are you gonna get your grant? Many of the things we need to accomplish in science and medicine today are team-driven. What if you made a huge contribution to the team and you didn't get on the paper? Or you were third author over and over? Can you progress? Can you get promoted? Can you win prizes and be recognized? A huge issue across all team-based science and something that is something I'm passionate about, rewarding team behavior. So pushing to team prizes and making sure that collaboration is rewarded in a system that has for a long time rewarded individual behavior. Something that as chancellor, I can promote and celebrate that kind of team behavior that's good for patients and good for the kinds of outcomes that we want. So I, I want to leave most of my time for questions, but I wanted to end my prepared remarks with, with two big ideas. Um, and I know this building and this campus is filled with big ideas. Uh, if you're reading the papers, you would read this week that the Food and Drug Administration uh, here in the U.S. has just rejected their third in a row new obesity drug. Remember what I said about the 12 years and the 1 billion? Picture yourself ha being at the finish line for approval after, you know, let's say it's 700 million to 1.2 billion dollars and years and years of basic research and clinical trials with a new obesity drug. The most recent one, you can read about it in the paper. You go and you say to the Food and Drug Administration, the patients lost on average four and a half pounds. That's actually a true figure, I didn't make that up. And FDA says, well gee, we wonder in 10 years if more patients who are treated with this might get heart disease than the patients who didn't get this. So we want you to do that study, company A, and come back in 10 years and tell us if that four and a half pounds of average weight loss was accompanied by an excess of cardiovascular, more heart attacks and strokes, because if that's the case, that's bad for you. So the net of these three bad outcomes in a row inevitably will be companies who are smart, and companies tend to be smart, 
aren't going to develop new obesity drugs because they see this very long journey that's expensive and questions that come up about long-term safety. So one of the big ideas I have, and I know you've had speakers who have talked about regulation, particularly in the device uh, side of the industry. One of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, on making new innovative products in life sciences is the binary outcome of FDA approval. So it, put yourself in the shoes of an FDA reviewer, OK? So you're in charge of reviewing the new drug. And you have two outcomes. Yes, this is safe and effective for obesity. And perhaps millions of patients are going to be exposed to that drug. And if they do have an excess of heart attacks, it's your fault. How often are you going to say no? Always. There's no benefit to you to saying yes, and all the risk is on you because you've only got an answer of yes or no. Well, if you really follow product approvals and the course of product approvals and all of what's been in the paper about side effects, you'll know that life doesn't come in binary. It's a maybe. So maybe this drug is safe and effective after 10 years, and maybe not. The reality is we don't know at the time of product approval what the long-term consequences of new medicines are. So my big idea is to give FDA and that poor reviewer all of the onus on them to protect patients from side effects, but also wanting to give therapeutic benefit to treat it as a continuous variable rather than a dichotomous variable. A continuous variable would have a range of certainty, of confidence. And that confidence would come over time. So for example, the FDA could say, no, four and a half pounds. That's not enough. It's not enough to make any side effects acceptable. On the other hand, let's say it was 10 pounds. But you still had uncertainty. You could have an approval process that started out with a low level approval. Uh, you don't get a sales force. You can't promote that drug. And you can't put TV ads on. But you could sell it. Then you increase your confidence. We haven't seen any heart attacks after five years. It's looking good. The 10 pounds is really holding up. And in fact, some of the patients, as they stay on the drug longer, lost 15 pounds. OK, maybe you can have a sales force. Still no ads on TV. Then you gain more confidence. It gets to be eight years. Is there a system where we could, as we increase our confidence in safety and efficacy, allow for broader distribution and more promotion? Not a yes or a no answer. I think that could really change two things. One is the odds and the business model would be more stacked in favor of investing in difficult things like obesity, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, that where we're at risk for no innovations. And the other thing is we could improve how we communicate to the public. Instead of saying, gee, I saw it on TV. It must be perfect. Can't have side effects and put it on the nightly news. We're doing a lousy job of communicating to patients that all medicines have consequences. So if instead of saying we're 100% sure it's good for you and not bad for you, to communicate every medicine has a consequence. Every medicine has a side effect. And this one, we have a lot of confidence or poor confidence. So I think that would completely change things. The other big idea that we've implemented at UCSF and is in its very early stages is a degree granting program called an MTM, a Master's of Translational Medicine. And this is a, a program designed to bring together life sciences experts, physicians, scientists, with engineers, computational experts, bioinformatics experts, to see if there are ways of bringing these two discipline areas together that we can increase the likelihood of success, increase the reliability and predictability of what we do in medicine, and ultimately, what I would love to see is, could we innovate in life sciences to bring down costs? So as I watch the high-tech industry, and I, I'm a consumer of high-tech products, every time I buy a new iPod, it's better and cheaper. Every time someone comes to my hospital for a new x-ray, it's better. Uh, it's not cheaper. So what would it look like in life sciences that as we iterate, each subsequent generation of product is less expensive and more reliable. And if we don't accept that challenge, we'll price ourselves out of business in the health sciences uh, area, maybe already are. But what would it take to innovate in product development, in delivery, 
and in how we think about health and wellness that could really change the game. And I think by putting the brightest minds together, it gives me some confidence that that's where we'll end up uh, in the future. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, happy to answer questions about any of that or anything else you'd like to ask me. Thank you for listening. That was terrific. I'm gonna take a page from Tina's book the last uh, couple of weeks and help uh, moderate the questions. I especially encourage Professor Roizen's yeah. class, the MS&E 178 students who meet afterwards uh, to kick us off. Anyone like to do that? Anyone else like yeah. to do that? <laughs> All right, well, I'll kick it off. All right, thanks. You guys, after yeah. me, any questions on Monday? Um, thank you, that was really, really interesting. And, and one of the things we talked a lot about is you know, we, we set up a and talked about your life before and all the entrepreneurial things that you did. And we were curious about your decision to go to academia. And what kind of challenges, what kind of differences do you face in recruiting, retaining, motivating people in an academic world versus, versus what you had at Genentech and how you're, how you're dealing with that? Maybe the biggest surprises and the things you're trying to accomplish in that way. So I would say that the... Um, the, and I'll start with me. So, so I made the decision uh, to move from Genentech to uh, UCSF in part because uh, Genentech became a wholly owned subsidiary of Roche. And so my group became a global division of Roche. And um, so for me as a leader, I really love the fact that we ran the company. I just thought that was so inspiring and so amazing to be able to set the values, the direction of a company. And, and I couldn't imagine not doing that anymore. I just really loved that part of my life at Genentech. And I was inspired to take on a leadership role at UCSF for that same reason. I think it is um, both daunting and inspiring to think of a large organization. UCSF has 23,000 people. And thinking about all those people collectively and what can I do as chancellor to help them succeed is really inspiring to me. So that was the main uh, motivator for me to make the shift. Um, I also was very inspired to get back uh, closer to teaching and to patient care, both of which I missed greatly in going to industry. Um, w when I was at Genentech, there were two things that I loved about, about leading at Genentech. One was that we had such a clear and simple purpose. We wanted to use the science of biotechnology to improve outcomes for patients. And in my group, we wanted to take those basic discoveries from the lab, test them in clinical trials, and then get them approved for sale. That was the group's job. And when I first got to Genentech, many people thought that that meant that it was fate whether we succeeded or not. You know, it's biology. It's it's medicine and that that you know it was it, it was in uh, um, it was not in our control whether drugs were safe and effective we just tested them and there was a somewhat passive nature to that and i didn't think anyone should pay us if it was fate <laughs> you know we were supposed to make good outcomes occur not every time but the outcome should have been that we advance the mission by getting products approved so what we did at Genentech, and I think it helped us um, meet our goals, is we broke down every year into a set of corporate goals that were measurable. So we put in place metrics and accountability, and we put a bonus program in place for the whole company that were around those metrics. So enroll a certain number of patients in the clinical trials, obtain FDA approval, um, get a label that included something in the label that was important for us. And I was so amazed to find out, one, that it was perfectly achievable in R&D to set metrics that were achievable and measurable, and two, that in fact people do what you reward them for. So you can set a common tone with corporate goals. They're measurable, they're rewardable, and the entire company would point in the same direction. I mean, when we got Herceptin approved in 1998, before we were finished with manufacturing a, a additional Herceptin, patients had to go through a lottery to get this life-saving drug. So we literally had half the company down packaging the Herceptin vials because we were so motivated to get it out for patients. You don't need a bonus to do that. You know patients are waiting. But it, for the things that are the steps along the way, where you can't see a patient directly benefit, breaking it down into metrics and rewarding that. 
At UCSF, one of the things that I think, and this is true with any university, that I found really challenging when I first came was to try and define what we all had in common. When I would meet people and they would say, well, I'm a pediatrician at San Francisco General, and I'm really caring for the underserved, and I'm passionate about that, and I show up every day for work happy to teach students and care for these kids. And then I would meet someone else who was uh, doing a, a basic biology of how the mitochondria works in the face of lupus. And I would try and think, OK, what is it that the pediatrician at San Francisco General and the basic scientist at Mission Bay share in common? And our tagline at UCSF is advancing health worldwide. And that is very inspirational. It's what we all have in common as a health sciences campus. And I thought that was great. That was really clear that that's what we have in common is our persona, our mission, our values. What about rewards? So how do you put in place a reward system for those individuals who have such, um, uh, such a big diversity of what they work on and their outcomes? A and including teaching outcomes. How do our students do? What are our graduation rates? Um, I think that has to be done locally when you're in academia. And you much more care about the, the, the institution's brand. What does UCSF stand for? The mission, the values, and the environment that allows people to have the resources. But locally, they have to set the goals and the reward system. And I found that to be the fact that I had in hand those corporate goals and that reward system that was so simple in retrospect. It's much more complicated in academia. And I think that people are much more motivated by two things. One is individual success in academia is more rewarded more commonly than team success. And they're much more rewarded, rewarded and inspired by the public good which does drive people to work for a university and in the public sector. And I think you can take advantage of both of those to drive outcomes. May I just do a little follow-up to that? And it's somewhat of a follow-up. So um, I know some of your faculty at UCSF, and they share our desire as part of our mission to teach entrepreneurship and teach innovation, and especially um, having to do with skill development. So in your mind, what are those skills? I mean, is it comfort with change? Is it being a t good teammate? I mean, what do you think are the key skills that we should be teaching here you know, to these students and what your faculty should be uh, slipping into their uh, courses at UCSF? So the, the people who I've seen um, uh, succeed as entrepreneurs, um, uh, there's, there's two things I would point out that I've observed and, and, and that are are true over and over again. There are many things that are quirky or, or uh, an individual will succeed and I'll think, boy, that's probably not um, reproducible. That, that may be a one-off or good luck um, because luck is actually really helpful. Um, whenever you can get it, be lucky. Um, but the two things that, that are, are very much um, important, one is this, this doggedness, impatience, relentlessness. Um, the, the, uh, um, we used to have a saying that I, I like, like someone's like a dog on a bone. Many of the entrepreneurs who are successful, who I know, are like a dog on a bone. They just won't leave it alone. Um, I, I have been um, teased about when people would see me, I, when I worked in, in uh, South San Francisco, I eventually only took public transportation, and you'll know why in a minute. I would be at a stop sign or a stoplight, and the stoplight would change color several times, and I would be sitting there with my head down muttering. <laughs> and, and the reason I was, I was just thinking, like, what can we do? Like, we got to enroll that trial faster. We got to get that answer. We got to do. And I was just, I couldn't turn it off. I mean, I just could not stop thinking. And just, and that sense of relentlessness, of staying awake all night, staying up all night, and, and, and you just can't let it go. Um, solving a problem. You don't accept that it's unsolvable. Um, that is a, um, and I think part of that is believing that if you work hard, surround yourself with smart people, keep thinking, keep trying, that you will solve that problem. So it's, it's also relentlessness uh, with optimism, I yeah. think, um, and they, they tend to travel together. And the other one is, is being unafraid to be embarrassed. 
you know, I remember telling somebody that we were going to make a huge difference in cancer patients with these, this new way of treating cancer patients with antibodies. And, and I still remember the conversation. The guy I was talking to literally in front of me rolled his eyes, like you guys. You know, it's going to be so embarrassing when you've spent your company's money and you've done this. And you, Sue, moved from the number one cancer company in America, Bristol Myers Squibb, traditional great cancer company, to Genentech. You know, what are you thinking? Do you have a backup strategy? You know, it's going to look bad that you moved from this great job you had. And I thought not at all about whether it would look bad. Um, and I would say the same about coming to UCSF. It, it, you know, you asked why I would go to UCSF. In my litany of what, what could go wrong, um, none of that was I would be embarrassed. And people who are risk takers, who are entrepreneurs, who are willing to change careers, try something different, um, don't, don't think of what others think of you. Think about the purpose or the outcomes you want. Um, and I think those two things being dogged and relentless to the point where some of the entrepreneurs I've worked around aren't really that much fun. Uh, you know, you don't want to be with them at a party, but boy, you want to be on their team if you're on a new venture. So, I, so now that you said that, I have a follow-up question. And I know you won't mind my asking this, because you just said you're, you're not afraid to be embarrassed by anything. <laughs> oh, now you guys are really the best to embarrass me. <laughs> Great. One of the things we talked about, though, is, is that the role you've really taken on is, is, is that it's somewhat of a public figure. And you've had to deal with things, personal shareholdings, uh, labor, uh, things like that. How do you deal with that? What would you recommend to the students who ultimately face those sorts of challenges? And how much of your time do you spend dealing with, with those sorts of things? What's your strategy for that? Well, that is the th part of my job that I probably underestimated, um, uh, which is that um, when you take on a role like this, particularly at a public university, you are um, you're like the mayor. You know, in many ways, there's there's a lot of rules that govern what I do and don't do, and there's the Public Records Act that anybody who wants can ask for all my emails and my trip reports and things like that, and my stock holdings and gifts and and travel and so forth. Um, it, how do I deal with that? Well, I, what I try to do is, is, is two things. One is I've always had a, um, a wish to, to make sure that having worked in a highly regulated industry and with patients for so much of my life, my most important compass is inside. Not the newspaper, not what people say about me. And it is very possible for, for me to disappoint myself and nobody no, knew it. I'm, I, I like that saying, I'm my own harshest critic. I am so my own harshest critic. So, so one is to make sure that in, in being a public figure, I don't turn towards avoiding what the paper says about me or the unions say about me or whatever as my metric and keep my internal compass of what I expect from myself, but also to understand that in this role, I represent the university, so the stakes are different. It isn't me, you know, Sue Hellman, private citizen. It's me as representing the university and what we stand for and what we do. Um, so it takes a lot of self-coaching. <laughs> right, Brian. Um, how close, dependent or independent, do you think academic institutions like UCSF should be from industry, the industry they work in? So I think that um, there's something Could you really. Repeat that question, uh, just in case. Yeah, this is a question about the independence of organizations like UCSF from industry. So the the perception or the reality of conflicts of interest and directions from industry to uh, to public institutions or universities, um, and, and I think it's a, an essential question. So so it gets to something that I value very much about being UCSF and being a university. And that is trust. So, so there are two things that we have to balance when we interact with anybody, with a patient, with an institution, with the government, with private industry, but particularly with private industry. And those two things that we have to balance are the trust and confidence that the public places in us and our faculty to say truth. Not truth as per somebody who's giving them money, but truth as they understand it today to the best of their ability. And that is a very precious thing. It's hard to gain and it's easy to lose. So that has to be balanced with a fact. And the fact is UCSF does not commercialize products. So if someone at UCSF makes a discovery, be it a device, a new operation, a new medicine, 
and wants to commercialize that, that will be done by private industry. So for me, the need to keep that trust and confidence means that we have to set up contracts and procedures and transparency that enables that industry interaction and collaboration without impacting in a negative way the public's trust and confidence. But I, what I don't want us to do is scare people away from working with industry, which I think is not only acceptable, but can be a real positive. Um, so I don't want people to get a scarlet letter, and I don't want dry, to drive people into secrecy. I want it to be transparent and easy for them to work with industry. Where it gets really hard is in the procedure area. So um, it, where it's very easy is when you're working on, on experimental systems that don't involve humans. As you get into humans, it's much harder. And as you get into procedures, it's extremely hard. And here's why. So let's say I made a new catheter. And that catheter is really good for patients who just had a heart attack to avoid their next heart attack. And I'm really good at putting that catheter in, best in the world. And you come to me, and there's five other catheters, but I'm really sure that mine is the best, and I'm the best at putting it in. So who should give you advice about your catheter? And who should put it in, me? I'm going to get a royalty. So that's really tough because I, it, you know, my, it, when I talk about my compass, my strongest compass is what's best for a patient. Always has been. I'm a doctor. So I want you to have the best doctor to put in that catheter. But if the best doctor made that catheter and has a gain from that, I find that really hard. And that's where I think very careful systems have to be built up so that you, you don't harm the patient by not letting the person who can put that in. But the patient has to have their eyes wide open to all of what those conflicts could entail. That's the trickiest part of that. Let's go way in the back. Yeah, I had a question if you could talk a little bit more about the risks involved in, in either position that you've been in, um, in the sense that, as you mentioned, life science, you're kind of playing with, with people's lives. So when you're talking about 10-year horizons, multi-billion dollar projects, <coughs> with impact on, on tangible human beings. How do you do kind of a cost benefit analysis and a resource allocation for choosing what to invest in when the stakes aren't just financial, but you know, human <coughs> lives and um, a researcher's potential entire career when you're right, talking 10 right. years? So the question is about how do you balance this, this risk of um, adverse outcomes long after you have a drug approved? Um, it, the, there's a few principles that I think you can use from um, that, that I like because they align business interests and patients' interests. Um, and so I've always used these principles as, um, as uh, aspects of how you do product development that are really clear and actionable. And, and the principles are, are as follows. One is all this, this um, uh, concern, appropriate concern about side effects, diminishes in the face of patients who are in harm's way. So there's always been a principle in oncology that you treat patients who have metastatic disease, disease that's spread, in part because those patients have a disease that today you can't cure. So, so when you're balancing benefit and risk, if the patient who you're treating early on in that drug's life before you understand its side effects, um, has an incurable disease, th the stakes for that patient are so high that they're going to die that you can accept those side effects. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. And the reality is that patients have told me, and I think they're right, you're overprotecting me from side effects. <coughs> I'm the patient. I've got six months to live. You protect me from a drug that might have side effects in five years? It, you know, so, so I guess the, the pearl there is listen to patients. Never stop listening to patients. They're always going to give you a better answer than your own mind because they're in harm's way. So in, if it is possible to treat patients who, ha, who are staring a bad outcome in the face, that is the best experimental system because they don't have options. So I think that is absolutely the most important thing. The second thing, and I think this is where academia needs to innovate, um, and, and we must, must, must address this. So as I mentioned, my career was heavily influenced by the HIV AIDS epidemic, having been at, at UCSF and, and traveled to Africa. I mean, it's sort of a horrible thing to say, but true. When I went to Uganda, the first trip back to UCSF was six months later. All my patients had died. 
I went back to the AIDS clinic and all my patients had died when I came back six months later. I mean, that's just shocking. What changed that? So just in a few years, that wasn't a death sentence. There was a surrogate marker for outcomes in HIV AIDS. You could measure viral load in the patient's blood. So again, this benefit risk, if you could markedly decrease the viral load and you could measure that in a month, you knew right away you were helping the patient. That's why I like infectious diseases. The readout is so fast. So anything you can do to read out something that predicts the future benefit early, again, allows you to balance that risk and benefit. So we need better markers in diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular, cancer, that tell us, gee, here's what's going to happen to this patient 10 years down the line with their cancer so that we can balance that benefit with the risks. We don't have those tools today. How about right here? Uh, yeah, so you talked a little bit about life sciences with the technical and sort of, mm -hmm. and that's sort of one of the things that I've always seen with healthcare and it's been like a huge problem is that, you know, the entire process from being diagnosed to being treated and cared for has always been, you know, you have to go to an expensive specialist who, you know, not only do they expect to be paid, you know, for the fact that they've gone and, you know, trained for 10 years or however long, but that also makes it, you know, unable that these people are able to work in developing parts of the world. So as medicine goes forward, how, how much do you think sort of places like UCF, uh, UCSF and sort of this research and development is going to be focused on more pumping out the most specialized people that we can or pumping out things that allow people who maybe aren't as specialized but to diagnose, to treat, and sort of, you know, sort of these cost-effective ways of approaching problems versus throwing brilliant people at a problem, I guess. So that is a, a fantastic question. The question really gets to what do we do with a healthcare system? Um, I, I, I like the description of our healthcare system. It's neither caring nor a system. So uh, it, it is not uh, where we need to be. It, one of the things I'm really excited about is the opportunity we have in medicine to make some changes in things that are actually not that complicated. Um, and so what you're describing is something that increasingly we're all talking about, which is, is on two ends of the spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you have 30 million more Americans who hopefully will have insurance between now and 2014 so that everyone has access to health care. And I'm definitely a believer in access to, to health care as a right. If we have 30 million more Americans, we need the healthcare providers to provide very basic services. And yet we do two things that don't make sense. One you mentioned, which is we throw high-end remedies on low-end problems. Um, so we might have a provider who cares for somebody who has skills that allow them to do brain surgery, um, and, and they're your front end provider. I mean, that may not make sense if you don't need brain surgery. So we need to have the skill set match up with the problem. The other thing is increasingly, we're asking ourselves, did that, did that problem or that issue need a caregiver? I mean, wh why do you go to the doctor to get your blood pressure checked? Couldn't that happen at home where you're not scared and just drove and found a parking space so your blood pressure's up? I mean, we do <laughs> things in medicine that are not sensible. You know, so on, the, on your basic primary care, family medicine, community medicine, we need to drive towards simpler remedies and more cost-effective remedies. On the other end of care, we need to, we need to fo and, and I'm grossly oversimplifying, but what we need to sort out are, are two aspects. One is something that people call, and you know, if you're a physician, you kind of cringe at this, but a focus factory. So a focus factory means that if, God forbid, you do need neurosurgery, are you at the place, are you at the academic medical center where that guy or that gal just did 10 of those surgeries this week? Or did they last do one 10 years ago? So for those very high-end procedures, can we minimize the number of places that do those so they get very, very good at them? And then are we really thinking about end-of-life care? We spent 80% of the money in the last couple of years of life not helping someone die 
in ways that are more humane often. So how do we think about end of life care? And when we have that discussion, people worry about death panels and you know, not saving their loved one. But we have to have that hard discussion about end of life care and what we spend on end of life care. In whom should we do the heroics? Um, if, if you look, there's a very nice article by a physician named Atul Gawande in The New Yorker just uh, last week about chronic illness and how so often the costs of health in chronic illness are driven by social issues, substance abuse, homelessness, lack of a job, lack of access. So thinking about what is the root cause of the problems we're trying to solve with modern medical care, they may not be amenable to the remedies we're using. So all of that is part of some of the pilots that are going to happen as part of healthcare reform between now and 2014. Should we do one more right here? But innovation here at Stanford, we talk about collaboration between life sciences and medicine and business and engineering and law. And given that UCSF is only a life sciences campus, what's your vision for fostering innovation in this collaborative way there? So that's, that is a fantastic question. And one of the things that, um, that I think we have uh, organized for ourselves is an ability to interact with other campuses. Um, so. Uh, global uh, health is a really a very good example. Um, I would throw into what you mentioned, uh, agriculture, really Im increasingly important in global health. So we've put together uh, global health initiatives with Davis, with UC Berkeley, with Santa Cruz, with UCLA, so that we're going across the UC campuses. And specifically in health, there's an organization loosely called UC Health, and that is the five uh, campuses at UC that have academic medical centers. And UC Health are working together on innovations that uh, start at how we do contracting, how we deliver care, how we do purchasing together, but end up uh, looking at some of the things I was just talking about in healthcare reform and how we can collaborate across the five UC Health Sciences campuses to solve medical problems. Um, we also now have a joint uh, um, bioengineering program with UC Berkeley. So increasingly, when it involves law uh, and engineering and life sciences, we collaborate with Berkeley, who also don't have a medical school. So uh, it's a good collaboration. Actually, they're pretty close. And you can go under the bridge, which is essential. <laughs> so uh, the, the bridge is, is an impediment. But we increasingly uh, collaborate across with Berkeley. All right. Thank you so much. Join me. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.